partner there uh, in the back of the room at Hageva, and, and I and one other folk uh, from New York, um, you know, come once a month. And, uh, and uh, actually, um, the weather today is better here than it is in San Francisco, just to let you know. So we're all going home. <laughs> that's right, that's right. But it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I, I get to um, not only work in Silicon Valley, but I get to work here in, uh, in Israel, which is a phenomenal place. Uh, it's, uh, I don't have to tell you that, but uh, the, the curiosity, the tenacity, the focus. ...to uh, work with smart people like my partner back here, other places around the world, like uh, Taiwan, Shanghai, as well as the um, as well as people in the uh, in the um, in the United States, working not only with healthcare technology companies, but also you know folks like Google, SoftBank, Microsoft, Samsung, um, and and that really helps with this new breed of what's happening between IT and MT. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, about that. But the point is, from clinic, from concept to clinical integration is where we're kind of all on the same, on the same pathway here. The Bay Area is a kind of a funny place. Um, it, it has this collision, if you will, between the, the kids. They're your age, starting these companies, which is terrific. But there's old horses around, like myself, that have been involved in some of the life science issues, some of the um, healthcare technologies, and in fact, about an 18-mile radius of Hoover Tower, which is kind of right in the middle of Stanford, in 2006, 50% of all the life science approvals were from that geography. And that, together with what's going on with the kids, the young and the restless, I call them, and some of the issues that are going on from LinkedIn all the way to Facebook, really make for a very interesting milieu. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But, but it is a bubble right now in the Bay Area. We've got companies like Alibaba that equals the market cap of Johnson & Johnson. We have Facebook at $155 billion and a number of these different bubbles, if you will. Now, the difference between the bubbles today and the bubbles in 1999, when you guys were two, was the fact that they didn't have revenues. Okay? Today they have revenues. So these are sustainable bubbles, but they're still bubbles. And what's going to happen is these bubbles are going to roll over the borders and get into health care. And that's what is kind of one of the most fascinating things that's happening. We just did a course over across the, across the campus here about this whole mobile connected health issue. And we'll talk a tad about that. Um, so um, there's different types of disruption. Disruptive and innovation is something that uh, I've been able to participate in. We now put a heart valve in through your groin. I used to have to cut open the whole chest. Now in 20 minutes I can put one through your groin, and you can go home tomorrow. That's disruption. And then there's a bunch of facilitated innovations that surround or penumbra around that disruptive innovation. I'm not going to talk about any of those because you probably have talked about those, you know, from diabetes all the way to heart failure. What I'm going to talk about is reverse innovation and Lego innovation. Reverse innovation is something that is very interesting, is going to happen more and more, and is happening in geographies other than the United States. Um, but before we do that, 90% of all successful startups come from an idea by a healthcare provider. That could be a nurse, could be a doctor. Getting together with somebody technical. That's where 90% of all these ideas come from. And I see it here all the time. You know, on Thursday afternoon, you've got an anesthesiologist sitting with a chemical engineer. And they come up with the napkin concepts, I call them. And again, that's the important thing. But you always have to focus on an overwhelming need. If it's not rooted in a need in healthcare, it's not going to work. You cannot go find technology and say, okay, how do we apply that to diabetes? It has to come from the problems in diabetes and then go look for technology. And part of the army that I've come to learn here is a great unification of not only contacts, but multidisciplinary efforts that happen later on when I see these startups here. And that's a very important issue. In biodesign, we started this many years ago. You were probably one then. Um, but we couldn't figure out how to get the smart professors or doctors at Stanford taking their concepts and making a company out of it. They didn't know what to do. So we put on these things called Medical Device 101 uh, back in the 98, 99. And then we decided to do what was called biodesign. Five of us got together. And that today has been 
emulated in some source. I'm happy to say we had a graduate last year here from, uh, here from Tel Aviv. And, uh, and this is something that, again, starts with the need, multiple needs, then the iteration of concepts. But today it's not just coming up with an invention. It's coming up with the process for which that invention gets integrated into the complex healthcare. Now, that's a mouthful, right? But that integration is very, very important. You can't just come up, and I used to come up with little smart concepts, me and a founding team, and we'd sell this to J&J for $50 million. Can't do that anymore. You have to come up with this and a prescription around it to take care of your presbyopia. You have to have a process for which this integrates in, and you have to do that early on in the startup. You can't do that like we used to. Oh, yeah, maybe we should think about whether this saves money for the system. No, -uh. you have to think about that right at the very beginning. And we try, try to bring those issues up front, close and personal, if you will, uh, when these uh, biodesign folks start. Um, another thing that we teach is you have to fail. If you don't fail, you haven't tried hard enough. I've failed so many times, you could alphabetize them. And those failures have to be accompanied by getting back up on the tree. Because you'll probably fail again. Now, this is a problem in some cultures. In Japan, you fail, the next thing you think about is a bullet. Oh, I'm being, I'm being recorded, aren't I? That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. Um, but, but, but seriously, they, they don't like to fail. And, and culturally, I respect it, but it's a problem for folks that are going to be innovative in especially the life science area. So don't be afraid to fail, folks. I've failed a million times, and I'm going to show you about some of my failures. And a lot of the failure is ego and not surrounding yourself with smarter people. And that's another very important part of this. Can you teach inventions? Absolutely, wholeheartedly, no. Inventions are spontaneous, they're unplanned, they're not taught. They usually happen with you folks, the youth, a little bit of chaos and some restlessness. This country does have a little bit of that. And that edge is where people invent in. You're comfortable in life and you've got your designer jeans and you go have your designer salad and you've got your designer car. You're not going to invent the next thing that's disruptive. It's a little bit of angst is good. If you haven't read this book, you should called the click moment. Franz is a friend. Um, but this is what happens when you get that anesthesiologist next to the chemical engineer. And what I generally do is I say, okay, anesthesiologist, I want you to start at 6 a.m., going all the way to 6 p.m., and bring that engineer through your day. And I want you telling them not what you like, but what you dislike about your day. And that chemical engineer or electrical engineer will say, well, why do you do it that way? And the guy will go, well, that's how we've always done it. There's an opportunity for a click moment there. So you have to basically, and you can't plan that. You have to basically get a room like this, have eclectic people that interact, and things happen. They start spontaneously. So we talked about the invention. Now, you can teach the next phase, which is innovation, and that's what we do at biodesign. And that's what hopefully I'll, I'll get invited back, and you know, as this biodesign program matures here, we'll be able to participate there. But innovation is the logic of how you take that invention, the process of how you take that invention to commercialization. It involves initially the three Ps. You have to have IP, you have to have a prototype, and you have to have some sort of preclinical indication that this is going to work in an animal, in a frog, something. And if you come to me with an idea, an invention, and it involves a CAD drawing, it's too complicated. Things always get more complicated. I want to see duct tape. Okay, simple, 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 because I guarantee you it will get much more complicated along here. And the biggest pothole that everybody fails in is this, execution. They don't bring on business people, operational people, quick enough. When was the last time, I'm going to use an American analogy, we have this thing called the World Series. Now, somehow we think we're the world. We just call it the World Series. It's just the United States. But how often does a pitcher start in the first inning and end up in the ninth? Anybody? Very rare, except for one guy during the World Series. It happened to be on the San Francisco Giants this year, but we won't get into that. Um, but very rarely. And so along this process, you really have to bring smarter people around. A CEO that starts in the first inning and is there in the eighth, I'm suspicious. Because usually they don't have the talent 
the experience, the know-how to stick around to the whole thing. So they back off. They become the founder and maybe the CTO and bring in somebody. Bring in experience. Bring in somebody that's smart. Again, the combination of talents, the stethoscope and the screwdriver. Here's two guys. This dorky guy on the left is a guy named Edwards. He's a hydraulic engineer. The big tall guy is Star. He's a surgeon. He's got a hydraulic problem with patients in their valves. So he figures out how to replace a valve. And this became one of the biggest components to how you treat valvular heart disease. Now that became Edwards Life Science, uh, ultimately. But again, two funny-looking, eclectic people that contribute something orthogonal. That's when you get a, a click moment. One of the sports that I do, too, is I fix people's arteries when they have a heart attack. So you see this over here? This is a very thin, this is um, dye going through an artery, so, so that represents the blood, and it's very thin. So as I start to exercise here, I don't get enough blood down here to the myocardium. So we put in a stent, but this time we put in a stent that has a drug on it. Combination of a doctor working with a chemical engineer came up with this. Not only a mechanical solution, but a biologic one as well. That's disruptive. That's disruptive in medicine. And, of course, we saw John Wild, who needed to diagnose bowel obstruction from the outside. How did he do that? He got together with a guy named John Reed, who knew something about ultrasound because he took it from his ocean experience of looking for things that had air in it. And they got calm. They worked together, and this is from the 1955. I was not even born then. Um, um, uh, for how ultrasound got into medicine. Again, orthogonal disciplines increase the, 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 the click moment. Funding is one of the kernels for successful startups. There's an awful lot of money throughout the world. It's distributed in funny places and not necessarily predictive places. There's a lot of it on the West Coast, and most of it is in Silicon Valley. But what I don't want to do is talk about that. What I want to talk about is the fact that despite in 2008, $27 billion were going in to startups, and despite the fact it dropped with the 2009 crisis, and the fact that it's up again now, it doesn't matter what the amplitude is, 25% of it always finds its way to healthcare. Okay? So all those magazines that you read that say, oh my God, life science is doomed, everybody's going off to find a Twitter, it's momentary. It's this ebb and flow we see. That you will always be able to raise some money from. Now, it's a little bit different because a lot of the VCs have decreased, okay, because there's a lot of regulatory issues. IPOs haven't been that friendly in the last decade. But what's happening is new people are emerging to really fill in this funding. I'm doing more funding with Johnson & Johnson, with Medtronic with Abbott, with Samsung, with Google than I ever have before. Don't be afraid of bringing those strategics in more. I think in Michel's fund, 40% of all the companies that we have are funded at an early stage by strategics. Listen, folks, we don't know everything. Doctors think they know everything. We probably know something about patients and what the needs are, but we have to make sure we know something about portfolios. The chance of you being able to come up with a snap moment and an invention and take it all the way to building a multi-billion dollar industry is a very low probability. You have to do it in segments here. You hand this off at some point that knows how to commercialize and integrate into healthcare, like the Johnson & Johnsons. They don't come up with the inventions, though. You do. But at some point, you have to pass this off. And working with strategics earlier keeps you oriented towards the portfolios, towards the white spaces that they need to expand into. We know something about patients, but you have to know something about portfolios. So working with these strategics that I see involved a lot more. Now, the fact that VCs are running doesn't mean innovation in healthcare is going down. It's actually going up. So the opportunities are, in fact, better today than I've ever seen them in the last 25 years. So it's an interesting change that's going on. Who's been to Shanghai? Okay, this is what it looked like in 1990. Okay, there was no cell phones, basically. Um, and I want you to just look at this one little tower here, okay? This is a picture taken not too long ago from the Westin. And just again, look at the difference in less than 15 years. Now, Rothschild Avenue doesn't look that different. 
my University Avenue, Stanford, doesn't look that different in this time frame. That's a huge difference. So the global process of innovation, the global process of healthcare is here to stay and has to be thought about and has to be addressed. I have a great honor and opportunity to work with a number of folks, certainly here, with Michelle and all the smart folks like you, you folks. I do get to spend some time in, in, in Asia. The Bio Design Asia program, I work um, there in Shanghai and Taiwan, and then, of course, in the Bay Area. And just in that last sort of 18 months, in some of those companies, myself and others have been associated with, we've gotten many approvals from China all the way to the United States, five M&As, acquisitions, three IPOs, and six companies are in revenues, just in that last short 18 months. So all the things you read about, that healthcare is not a great area to get into from the people that have to hedge funds, don't believe it. It's just not in the same spot that it was. It's not all in the Bay Area. It's not all in Boston. But globally, it's more active than I've ever seen it. So just be careful about that. The anatomy of a startup founds on a large clinical need always moves into simple technology. It's got to involve duct tape, team, IP. You have to know about regulatory issues, reimbursement issues. This is all as you're starting your company. We never had to think about that in the 90s. And you have to understand cost effectiveness. What's the most important thing up there? What's the thing that usually generates a failure mode in a startup in life science? Okay, you're right. That's what everybody was going to say, right? The team. <laughs> you got to surround yourself by better people. If you're the smartest one on the table, it's the wrong table. Okay, always get smarter people. Okay, the team, the team, the team. All the way through. That's the biggest failure mode I've had, and it's the biggest failure mode I've, I've seen over time. So we start with the prototype. We have to wrap it around with intellectual property, regulatory path has its own, clinical validation, integration, cost effectiveness, reimbursement, all those issues along the spectrum. Many, many, many potholes to fall into. So let me tell you a couple of mine, okay? And let's talk about the IP. This is a patent I had. I think I was in the operating room or in the cath lab. I can't remember when I came up with an idea. And it wasn't just me. It was somebody else, too. I was with two other people. And we came up with this intellectual property that ended up forming a company. It's a pretty simple concept. It's basically to plug the hole that I'm creating in the groin when I'm going to treat somebody that has a heart attack. Because guess what? I gave them blood thinners and I just created a big hole. So you have to do something about that, okay? So this is a little expanding plug. We had IP on how you delivered the plug. We had IP on the plug composition itself, which by the way was like suture material polylactic acid with a little PGA thrown in. And it was very simple. And, you know, I said, geez, this is going to be worth a lot of money. And what happened was somebody advised me to make sure I had all the IP covered in the space. And I said, I do. Look at my patents. They're great. Ego. Look at my patents. They're great. I don't need anybody else. And let me tell you, if you ask a lawyer and you hear the word, we can get around them, change lawyers. Okay? What you want to do is ask that same lawyer before you fire him, okay, that's fine, but if we had this patent over there, would you feel more comfortable? That they'll say yes to. But don't try to get around things. If you can, go bring in more that may not be your patents, mine are the best, bring in more patents that can help corral the area. I didn't, and I lost a lot of money for people. We sold this for $94 million, but $18 million were held in escrow for four years, and we ended up only getting half of that. So some of the investors that were in this company that we started were a little bit upset. With one patent that I could have gotten, it wouldn't have caused J&J to have to put this escrow, which is basically insulation. They're going to use that money for litigation. Okay? So, guys, gals, be open. Don't bring ego into the game. Say you don't know. Say that's a good suggestion. We'll go research it out. Always try to answer the unobvious. The obvious is easy. It's a plug. We have a hole that needs to be plugged. But look at the unobvious. What if the plug goes into the body? What if it pops out? 
What are those conditions? Be prepared for things that are the unobvious. And that's, again, a number of areas that I learned. Here's another one, regulatory path. Here's a device we came up with. It was four of us. And when we go in and put in a, a stent or fix an artery, we do it with a wire first, a very thin wire, and we snake up by x-ray. And when it's there, we slide things over it. Okay? So we came up with a smart wire, a wire that had in the middle of it a little drill. Okay? Now, why would you want that? Well, if you can get that wire to an artery that's completely plugged, you need to open it. So with a little wire, you can drill it. Now, this little wire had the same exact diameter as the wires that were already approved. It had the same material on the outside. It just had this little attitude at the tip. So as we started this company, we had a little piece of capital equipment. It was about this big, disposable. Had IP on that. Had IP on this. 2008, we started doing clinical cases, and, and what happens with, a, with a, 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 a chronic total obstruction is what that is. That little nub in there can be opened up. You get the wire there. You peck at it with this attitude, and you open up that whole artery, okay? And I can do it with that wire, and I already have wires approved. So this is going to be easy. That's in the heart. I'm going to do this in the leg, too. See? It's occluded. I bring in that little wire that's got an attitude, and now I've opened up the artery. Geez, this is great. I'm doing it in the heart. I'm doing it in the legs. I'm rich. And if you ever say that, I fire people, actually. I don't want people to think about money. I want to think about, gosh, what I can do to these patients. I can fix their heart. I can fix their thing. And once I fix that open, I put in stents. Now, the big companies love that because they can use more stents in something that they didn't have an open artery in, right? So I said, this has got to be a 510K pathway. You know what 510K is? It's sort of a... The, the non-pre-market approval that you have to get for a drug, let's say. It's a less of a, of, a, of, of a regulatory path. I said, there's no way. This is a 510K. I told the investors, there's no way that can be any more complicated. It's going to be a 510K. No patience. You should give me those $5 million because we're going to be, we're going to go to the moon. Well, that was in 2008. We got this approved at the end of 2010. Do you know how much burn that was? $5 million. Because the FDA said, we don't agree. You have to do 85 patients. So two years later, after I was so adamant that this is a 510K, and I was a consultant for the FDA, so they listened to me. Always, always look at the unobvious. What if they say it's going to be a problem? And I didn't. And as a result, when we sold this, um, we didn't get as much money. So my advice to you folks, whether it's Helsinki whether it's CFDA, which is China, TFDA, Taiwan, KFDA, guess what, Korea, or the FDA, go to them early, get smarter, find out, don't just have this opinion, and make sure that you come often to the FDA. Here's another one. A guy who was a great friend of mine, a neurosurgeon, and I sat one day with an engineer and we came up with this little device that looked like, and the way we thought about it is, you probably don't have these anymore, but you know these pens? We used to have these things called Bic pens, and they have a little spring in front, okay? And it fell out while we were having coffee, trying to think of a new way to take out blood clots from the brain. And it rolled on the thing, and it said, I wasn't the bright one. I looked at the thing, and I said, why don't we use a little spring like that? We could deliver that. It could come out and wrap itself into the blood clot and pull it out. It's like a corkscrew, okay? Well, look at the market. There's 700, today there's 825,000 strokes that are caused by these little blood clots that come from the heart or other pieces and get lodged in the head and get the uh, flow to the brain uh, decreased. There's half a million in Japan, 620,000 in Europe, 22% die. 56% have permanent disability. That's where the cost comes in. Okay? Some are wheelchair-bound. Some have a uh, uh, um, breathing tube in their neck, all that sort of stuff. So if we could come up with a simple little device that looked like that little big pen spring that fell on. So as we push this into a catheter, it comes out and unravels. And then we could go in and, and 
go engage into the blood clot that's up there and just pull it out, geez, that's pretty simple. So we got intellectual property on it. We got um, clinical cases. This is an example of this occlusion that's happening, this patient that has a stroke. We go in there. We pull it out with this little big pen on the end of a catheter, big pen spring on the end of a catheter, and reconstitute that blood vessel in an amazing way. These patients were walking out the door. Okay? <laughs> Once again, I'm rich. Don't ever say that. Um, so what, it, what was the problem here? Here's another problem. I didn't look at the obvious. I didn't look at, okay, we have a spring on the end of a catheter to treat a big market. Who's got control of those patients? Well, strokes happen everywhere. And they come into the ER, they get triaged. But who has real control of those? It's the people that know how to put wires up in the head. Well, guess what? There's only 208 of them in the United States. To address 825,000 people, we have a funnel problem here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and I didn't see that ahead of time. This company staggered along for 10 years until Stryker bought it, about three years ago. But this is a very important point. Who's got control of the patients? Where are the patients coming from? How are they flowing into the hospital? And how are they flowing within the hospital? These are complex issues, but you have to ask those things up front. So those are three, I could tell you 20 more mistakes that I made personally, and, and those are just important issues. IP, don't have ego. Don't think you know everything about the regulatory issues, get help. And from an integration perspective, ask the strategics, they deal with this all the time. We could have asked the COVIDians of the world how many interventional neuroradiologists could actually put this spring in the head, and we would have figured that out a lot earlier. And maybe help the process with education. And today there's over 600. Okay, so this would be a lot better today. But still, integration of your technology in the system is the biggest. Uh, know the customers, know how to integrate, and who has control of your patients. It's a very important issue, and it's a failure mode, and one that I've stepped into a couple times. So this is complex. There's lots of places to fail. Surround yourself with smart, uh, smart folks. Now, I'm going to sort of skip this part. This is the raise, which is, um, you know, I could make up numbers here, right? There's always a seed to sort of take that duct tape and turn it into a 3D printed prototype. There's always the phase period that lags a little bit for your intellectual property. And then you get into a Series A, which then gets it into the humans. And then you do a big raise, right, to kind of commercialize it. But that can all vary, Okay. So I don't necessarily want to get into that. What I want to get into is something I see that happens in Israel, and that's not necessarily a, a criticism. It's just an observation. I've never seen such swollen capitalization tables in my life. Now, what the hell does that mean? It means when you look at all the people that have invested, when I come in or when Mikel and I come in to invest, I go, Where? it's like a ballpark. There's like 50 people that put in a nickel. This is lawsuits, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> because somebody gets disgruntled, okay? So it's, but it's hard. How do you raise money? It's really hard to raise money. So you go sometimes to, you know, your friends and families, okay? You go to these people that are high net worth folks, and there's a lot of them in, 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 in Israel, and everybody's connected. But you've got to be careful that you make sure that you're serious enough about how to synchronize the capital to milestones, that will provide value. Most people look at raising money to achieve something. I look at raising money not to get screwed, can I say that on tape, on the next round. That's the worst thing to do, okay? You want to achieve something for sure, but you don't want to be messed up when somebody comes in, like some of these big VCs, and say, well, we don't think it's worth that much. They cram you down. So you have to think about the next raise when you're raising this, in addition to what you're going to achieve from a milestone perspective. And you always add 30% because it'll always take longer and it'll always cost more, I guarantee you. Okay, So add 30% and never want to go, oh my God, you're raising $2 million. Can't you just raise one? You'll get that all the time. But say, no, because I need to, because it happens. So you go, um, you go to these folks that ultimately look like angels. 
They're called angels, right? Life science angels, band of angels, Uncle Bob. They've had success in the IT area, and they're only 31, and they want to get into healthcare because they think it's fun. Parents, friends, bands of angels, these cap tables swell because it's got Aunt Martha in it and everybody else. The problem is their expectations about what they think they're going to get as a return is somewhat different probably than what you're going to return. Okay? So these folks change on you. And this is serious because some of them, like, they'll sue you because they don't feel that you've done the responsible thing. And that's a problem because once you have a lien on the house, once you have a lawsuit, regardless of its validity, it keeps you from getting funded. Okay? So what you want to do is you want to clean this up as it goes on, and you want to put them under one class, so they're in your capitalization table under one voting class. And one disgruntled person out of that hundred Uncle Bobs doesn't become your devil. So just pay attention to that when you go. Because the easiest way to raise money is to go out to family and friends or your credit card, right? But, but, but you've got to be careful because you've got to think again the next time you're going to raise money what happens. Okay, I'm just going to end by talking a little bit about uh, what, what I think is going to be very interesting. And I'd like to see folks begin to think about this. You know, so we may be here over in, you know, in engineering and we're thinking about life science. Go over and talk to a couple of these gamers. Go over and talk to some of these folks that understand the IT language. It's completely different. But this combination of information technology and the needs in healthcare is swelling. It's swelling at exponential rates. It makes Moore's Law look limited. Today there are over 100,000 apps for iOS and, uh, and Android platform. Lifestyle, personal fitness is beginning to merge into chronic care. Patients are taking control. Do you think my 13-year-old little girl or my 16-year-old little boy who within 30 seconds can order their tickets for the theater, can order their parking and get directions before they even get to the freeway? Do you think my little girl is going to wait three days to get her results from her MRI of her breast? Absolutely not. You think my boy's going to wait for anything more than a minute for his PSA when he's, you know, 40? Absolutely not. And even worse then, right? Because they have this thing between efficiency and exposure. Facebook, right? They don't care that much. They just want it. And they sift through it themselves in a very different way than I do. I mean, I give my phone to my kids and say, fix it. It's a very different issue that's, that's, that's coming. And you folks are right in that right in that storm, right in that middle part. I guarantee you your acceptance of what your health care is going to be, and you live in a very, very unique place here. You can get your digital data, you can make your own appointment, and you've got the second largest HMO in the world, right? First is Kaiser, second is Khalid, and then you have McCovey right behind it. This is unique. Nowhere else in the world is it like this. Provides an opportunity. You guys can pilot things, just like Waze did, and then scale. So part of the reason that Michelle and I are branching into this and have already made a series of investments are because piloting here is very unique for healthcare. You can do it in three countries, Taiwan, Switzerland, and Tel Aviv, but nobody has what Tel Aviv has. Nobody has what Israel has in terms of the startup mentality and the innovation up front. So this is a very interesting area that's going to be, I think, beaconed by, by Israel. Um, last year, I went to the CES, which is the largest computer, the largest show. It's called the Consumer Electronics Show. One fourth of everything that was being shown were these things, these wearables. You know, I have the new Samsung here because I'm, I'm the Samsung advisor, so I get all these things. But this thing is tracking me. I don't even want to tell you what it's tracking me. And it's going to the cloud, and it can do my everything from oxygen to um, electrocardiogram to heart rate variability, skin temperature, everything. Okay, and there's an article in the New York Times last week. It says wearables are going away. You know why people read it? Because they thought these are going to go away. And they're not going away. They're just people will consume them into the lifestyle and they won't even notice them after a while. Smart buttons. All sorts of things are coming. And that's going to be very important. But it's a front end only. Don't get romanced by this stuff. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to morsalize the data? How are you going to manage the data? How are you going to get it in the cloud? How are you going to do all those predictalytics? You know what Larry Ellison says about big data? He lives down the street from me. You know what he says? You know what he calls big data? You know who Larry Ellison is? He's the was. He's going to retire here. He's the CEO of uh, Oracle. 
So he's bought eight big data companies. You know what he calls big data? Big shit. He goes, I don't understand it. Everybody's so excited and everybody tells me I have to buy these companies. Be careful of big data. Big data is a big word right now. It's really going in there and getting the harmonization of data that can help you predict what's going to happen or personalize what's going to happen for healthcare. And there's value in that from a business model for sure. But you have to be careful and make sure you have that business model understood. Everybody's excited. You see the Time magazine's got more wearables than anybody can imagine. That's the peak. It's the tip of the iceberg. That is not mobile health. That's one little component. Remember the three C's. It's the cells or the sensors, the carriers, and the cloud. And like a string of pearls, you need to have those things put together. And so everybody's excited about this, but you have to watch for business models. They're important. Of course, Novartis and Google are getting together. Abbott, AbbV at least, and Google are getting together as well. There's this collision happening. And this collision is great because it's just like what we talked about as the fundamentals of your biodesign program, our biodesign program at Stanford. It's two people coming in with orthogonal thoughts. That's when you get click moments. And that's why this whole area is going to absolutely amplify. In terms of funding, we're in a bubble. There's going to be more money spent on these mobile, connected e-health things this year than medical devices. So it's definitely a bubble. But business plans and true revenue models are going to be the ones that distinguish these string of pearls. And that's what you're going to need to go over to the business school and get somebody that's used to looking at those issues together with the engineer, together probably with a healthcare economic guy or gal. You're going to have to get all those things in your company as you, as, as you go forward. <laughs> so this is an interesting thing. There's 5.2 billion that own a cell phone. There's only 4.4 billion that own a toothbrush. Um, there's actually an app that you can plug into your cell phone and it makes the, 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 the toothbrush vibrate. So you can actually brush your teeth with your cell phone. <laughs> my, my daughter found this on, on Alibaba. Um, but, um, but, but this is something that all of us look at 162 times a day for an average of 21 seconds. It's a couple hours of our waking day. So this has really changed not only our behaviors, but that behavior can be changed in healthcare too. Diabetes, chronic heart failure, and that's going to be what, what the exciting issue is. So I'm going um, to just end here by, um, by saying that innovation in medicine team is the most important. And I think that um, if you're the smartest person or you think you're the smartest, you've got you to find another table because you want to surround yourself by smarter folks. Constantly ask questions, listen, get colleagues to come in from a different space with a different view, get mentorship. It's very important. One of the things the Bay Area does have is a lot of mentorship. There's a lot of people that have made money, done well, but stick around and come back and help us at Stanford, help be on the board. It's very important. It's very important. Um, Integration in these healthcare systems, I've made a number of mistakes in this. You have to go talk to sometimes not the doctors, but sometimes the CFOs. Remember, the CFOs are making decisions based upon clinical practice, but also based on cost. And sometimes integration into the healthcare system has to be on either bundling or has to be on cost effectiveness. And sometimes these CFOs are very smart about that. So you always have to, or at least consider. Take dilution over added value. I always hear this about, I have never lost money in the company, well, let me just say it. I've never lost money that I've known of. I probably have lost money um, by sacrificing a little few percentages that I had personally in, in the cap table. D- dilution is this almost delirium that youngsters who are just starting try to avoid. Oh, my God, I can't get diluted. I owned 70% of the company when I started, and now I only own 30? Fine, own 20. It, it's not going to matter. If you have a home run... If this really works, it doesn't matter whether it's 20% or 30% multiplied by a big number. But when it's multiplied by zero, it's the same number. So just ease up a little bit on, on the dilutional conversation. And global markets are here to stay, and we have to think about that. You know, in my sport, I'm in the Bay Area. I sort of have everything at my fingertips. Um, but it's not all there. 
anymore. And that's where not the need is. The need is in Chennai. The need is in China. The need is in other parts of the world that I think is important for the innovation uh, discussion. And again, one of the biggest things you're going to see is this combination between medical technology and information technology and get to know it, jump into it. It's like throwing spaghetti against the wall. It's not that organized as we see with life science, but it's a different way. And out of that will spawn things you never even thought about. Again, bringing in eclectic people under the different roof is how you get that uh, click moment. Questions, comments, concerns? I was told to be out of here within uh, five minutes, so I wanted to skip a couple things so we could maybe get to a discussion. Nobody interrupted me. Why is that? I come here once a month. I come here once a month. We have, uh, Michal and I have offices in Herzliya, and so I come here once a month, and uh, I'm an Irish Catholic guy, but uh, it's a beautiful area. I learn a little bit about culture, and I meet a lot of smart people. So questions, come on. You can't be asleep. I didn't put you to sleep, did I? Yes, ma'am. As, a, as someone from the medical field, do you think that there's a future in those apps, or is it just one out of thousands? I think there's a future, but it's throwing spaghetti at the wall. I, I use another phrase. I said all these medical apps are annoying. Let me go back to one thing, one concept, if you don't mind. Um, I want to show you one thing that's happening. Why are the information technology, the Samsungs of the world, the Googles of the world, why are they trying to get into medicine? There always has to be a driver. You have to I, see what identify that driver. Here's what it is, partially. Moore's Law is going away. You know what Moore's Law is, right? Doubles every 18 months, half the price. That's going away. So you can't make these cell phones quicker and smaller anymore. So Samsung and Apple can't win on that. So what do they have to win on? They have to win on getting people. Okay, how do you get people? Well, you, there's a lot of people sitting over in those messaging areas. So what you're seeing is um, things like WhatsApp, things like WeChat and Tencent, things like Tango and Alibaba get together. Why? Because they're getting a larger footprint. Why was WhatsApp? You guys knew WhatsApp. So my kids didn't know WhatsApp. Okay, we didn't even know what it was. We were, my kids are still Facebooking, right? But there was a lot of geographies that Mark Zuckerberg didn't have. He had 450 million followers on WhatsApp, but it was in geographies he didn't have. What else didn't he have? When he began to look at all the different areas within WhatsApp that were be, it was being used for, they all of a sudden saw, saw a big peak because they didn't know. Same thing. They just spaghetti on the wall. But then they investigated why is there a retention that 70%, and a retention means that once you start it, you stay with it. 70%. Facebook has a retention of 38%. They just have a big denominator. So they started looking at that, and that's the thing you can do with software as a service. You can begin to look at the data and the usage pattern. And what was it? It was the fact that you were sharing pictures, something emotional. Now, what's more emotional than your health care? So this is one of the reasons that they're moving in, just like you saw with the WhatsApp, the WeChat, the Tencent. This is why these folks are moving into health care, because they think it's going to be really sticky. And if you're using a Samsung with a SoftBank, with some sort of cloud mechanics that Samsung can bring to you, too, and your health, family's health care is on there, it's going to be hard for you to move to an iPhone. So, so you take the example. This was bought for $19 billion. Jan made a lot of money. He's in the Bay Area. Um, it was done by a Russian and an Israeli. Um, and and um, it's probably worth $40 billion. You think Uber's worth $40 billion? Well, this is probably because it's real. So, so I don't know the answer to your question, but what people are doing is they're shooting darts and seeing what sticks. And that's okay. It's different than what we do in life science, right? We start out with an objective and we kind of move along in a processed way, but that's okay. And you're going to see that chaos meet the rigor, and there's going to be things that are spawning out of it. Michelle and I see this all the time. We probably see 10 of these a week and, and things that we didn't see a month ago. So it's a very interesting time frame, and I think uh, we're going to see a, a whole bunch of things that really ultimately can help patients. And that's the number one 
focus that we always have to keep in the crosshair. We're going to get kicked out in a minute, so a couple more questions. Jeez, I bored you, didn't I? (laughs) 